Good morning. Uh, the past few weeks we've been taking a look at the book of Romans, uh, studying through chapter by chapter, and we're going to continue doing that today with uh, Romans chapters 2 and 3. Uh, the book of Romans is unique in the Bible in its uh, genre. In the Bible there's lots of different types of books, different genres of books. I mean, you think uh, of the Psalms or the Proverbs, you have poetry, wisdom literature. Other parts of the Bible are more narrative in their style, right, or in their genre. They're like what we just read from the book of John, right, that's the biography of the life of Jesus, that's history. Uh, the book of Genesis is, is narrative, it's history. The book of Romans, though, what is its genre? Romans is kind of like a doctrinal essay. Uh, the Apostle Paul wants to make some very compelling points, and so he he says what he needs to say, and, and he, he puts logical arguments and, and adds supporting details to, to make the points he wants to make. Um, but maybe the idea of studying a doctrinal essay at like 10 in the morning on Sunday doesn't sound all that appealing to you. Maybe that sounds kind of boring, actually. Uh, but it's also good for us to remember that it's not just um, some sterile doctrinal essay in the abstract. Uh, this was a letter written to real people who had to deal with real life issues. To real Christians living on this earth, dealing with real life stuff. So what we look at today in Romans is it's going to be kind of heavy. It might get kind of deep, but I promise you it matters. I promise you this has real life application for today, right now. I'm also going to warn you what we're going to look at in Romans chapters 2 and 3. I don't know if um, this is still kind of rookie hazing or something like that, but there's no gospel in what uh, we're about to read. Um, this whole section from the middle of uh, Romans chapter 2 to the middle of Romans chapter 3, it's all law. Um, so today we're going to get a really, hopefully a, a really good understanding of what our interaction with the law should be, and then also I think that will give us a really good appreciation for the gospel. Don't worry, we will talk about the gospel uh, today. But just, just letting you know, there will be a lot of law and a lot of talk about how we interact with that. I'll put all the verses up on the screen. They're also in the, if you have a worship folder, the verses are in there as well. If you'd like to follow along or if you'd like to take some notes, uh, you're welcome to do that. We'll kind of go paragraph by paragraph, and I'll um, mention a few thoughts and things uh, in between. So let's start reading at, uh, I'll read Romans chapter 2, um, right, starting at, uh, at verse 12. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts, sometimes accusing them, and other times even defending them. This will take place on the, on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Well, we'll pause there. Apostle Paul wants the believers in Rome to know this, and he wants you to know it too. He wants us to know that we're all eventually going to be judged. If you know the law, if you grew up with the law, if you understand what God has said is right and is wrong, if you know it, he says that you're going to be judged by that law. Then you might ask, well, well what about all the people that don't know it? Like, what about all the people in the world who haven't studied God's law? They haven't studied what God says is right and is wrong? That wouldn't really be fair, right, for them to be judged if they don't know that? Well, God says they're not without excuse either. He says that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. It's what we might call the, the conscience, right? The conscience, right? The, the requirements of the law written on their hearts, it's, it's that feeling that a person gets, whether you're a Christian or not, when you do something wrong and you feel guilty about it. Why do you feel guilty? In fact, why have you decided in your mind that that thing is wrong? It's because God has written on, on the human heart some version of the law of what's right and what's wrong. It's why across cultures and across time, people seem to agree on there are certain things that are just wrong. They're, they're morally wrong. It's because God is the moral law giver who's written this law on our hearts. 
And so what the Apostle Paul wants us to know here is whether you know the law or, or if you don't, the law accuses you and the law condemns you. And in the end, you're going to be judged by the law. Now, why spend all this time mentioning this, talking about this? Um, in the church at that time, there were kind of two main groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. If you were a person from a Jewish background, it meant that you grew up knowing God's word. Uh, you grew up studying the law, studying the scriptures, hearing the stories, all that stuff. If you were a Gentile, you didn't have that background. In the New Testament church, after Jesus comes, he dies, and he rises, there's this huge influx of Gentile believers, people that didn't have the Jewish background, but are now also joining the church. And so you, you have these two groups. And there was a tendency, or maybe a temptation, for those that had grown up with this, that had studied this their whole lives, to kind of look down on those who were new to it. Those who knew the law, who understood it, who studied it all the time, to look down on those that, that maybe didn't understand it as well. In fact, uh, it's taken a, a level further here, not just to look down on the other believers, the younger believers, but also to look down on those who, who don't even believe. To say, well, I'm better than them because I know the law. <laughs> but God has kind of a, a, a harsh, biting word of criticism for them. He says this, uh, in the, the end of that first paragraph, it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Right? Just, just hearing the law doesn't make you right with God. You'd be right with God if you kept all of it. That, that's how you do it. And so he said, just because you understand the law, just because you've heard it, it doesn't make you any better than somebody who hasn't. In the end, we're all judged, in the end, by God's law. There's some really important applications today. I think for you and me. This, this accuses me. This, <laughs> this hits right at my heart. Do, do I look at... Uh, the world around me, at the societal and cultural norms, and you say, wow, that's, if only they understood God's law and God's truth, if only they understood how I did, and I put myself as better than those people. Do you consider yourself better than the, the drug dealer? Do you consider yourself better than the abortion doctor? Do you consider yourself better than the person who's proud of their sin? If so, you're using the law to be proud of yourself, to lift yourself up. You say, I know the law, I know the rules, but what God says is if you're not keeping them, you're not keeping them. Whether you know all of them or you only know a few of them, if you're not keeping them, you're not keeping them. <laughs> In fact, don't we do the same sometimes if we're more mature Christians? We say, well, you know what? I know God's word, I've studied it for a long time, I read my Bible every day, and when you have a conversation with someone who's a little weaker in the faith, a little younger in the faith, you end up getting this feeling uh, that you're wiser than they are, you're a little smarter than they are, that you're proud of yourself, because you understand the law a little better than they do. And what do you end up doing? You're putting confidence in your keeping of the law. You're not putting confidence in God and God's salvation, but you're looking really only at yourself. We're no more free from judgment than anybody else. That's what God says here. Well, let, let's keep on reading uh, in the next section here. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, you dishonor God by breaking the law. As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. It's pretty severe, isn't it? Calling out hypocrisy. 
That's what it is, right? Hypocrisy. Saying, well, well, I know better. I'm going to show you what's what. I'm going to show you what's right and what's wrong because I understand better than you do. It's hypocrisy. And it's, it's warned about all throughout Scripture, right? You think of the story with uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He's telling people not to judge hypocritically. And he says, uh, if you're going to point out somebody else's sin, uh, make sure to take the plank out of your own eye before you remove the speck from somebody else's. Uh, make sure that you, you examine yourself first before you start pointing out the sins of others. And that's what he's talking about here. He said, if you're going to go and point out the other sins of other people, uh, you, you better check yourself first. And, and maybe some of you wonder about some of the stuff said in here, because some of you are literally teachers of little, little children. Some of you are literally instructors of the foolish. You teach high school, right? <laughs> so, like, are you, are you not supposed to tell kids, are you not supposed to tell these students the law? Are, are you not supposed to point out their sin? God's talking about your attitude. If you're coming from an attitude of superiority, uh, that you say, well, I understand and they don't. I have it figured out and they don't. If you have an attitude of superiority when you're teaching someone the law, you've lost the spirit of Christ. Uh, you, you've lost his heart if that's how you are teaching, if that's how you are instructing. Because you're better and you understand it and you do it better than they do, that's why I'm going to share it with them. Uh, no, that's, that's not what God wants. That's not God's purpose with the law. His purpose with the law is not so that we can puff ourselves up and say that we're better and then, then point other people to show them how to be good like us. No, that, that, that'd be totally off, totally wrong. Maybe this kind of leads us to ask, what am I supposed to do then with God's law? Am I, am I supposed, to, supposed to point out sin? Doesn't God want me to, to uphold his law? Doesn't he, he want me to follow it and preserve it and hold it up? It's high and holy and it's such a good thing. Absolutely he does. Does God want us to follow his law? Yes, absolutely, absolutely he does. Does God want us to show people the error of their ways? When they're straying from God's word, when they're straying from his truth, yes, he wants us to do that. You know what God doesn't want? He does not want you to find your confidence, your security in your keeping of the law. God does not want you to find your confidence and your security in how well you know God's law and how well you know his rules. That would be a misuse of, of his law. He doesn't want you to find your confidence there. There's also this whole section here has some great application for today. In fact, when you when you're taking stock of your Christian life, when you're asking yourself, "How am I doing as a Christian?" If you ask yourself that question, "Am I, am I being a good Christian?" Where does your mind first go to? Maybe if you're like me, sadly. You end up just asking yourself, am I keeping all the rules? How many have I broken? How many have I kept? How is my keeping of the law? And so we evaluate ourselves on being good Christians on really whether or not we've kept the law or not. And sure, when we realize that we have sinned a lot, that may be a very good sign that we've restrained from God. But consider the reverse. If I think I'm just keeping God's laws really, really well, does that mean automatically that I'm being a good Christian? Is that what it means to be a good Christian, just to follow all the rules? Isn't it what it means to be a Christian is, is to be loved by God and saved by Jesus' death on the cross? Isn't it what it really means to be a good Christian it means to be covered in the righteousness of Jesus, not your own righteousness? Doesn't your Christian identity, isn't it, isn't it found in being a child of God and that it's this free gift for you, not something that you've earned? And we find ourselves asking ourselves that question, don't we? Uh, am I a good Christian? And we look just at how's my keeping of the law going. In fact, it's not just like an internal sort of thing. It also impacts the way we project ourselves to the world. We think, you know, I want this world to know that I'm a Christian. I want to have the opportunity to, to preach the gospel to people, to tell people about Jesus, and I want people to know I'm a Christian. What's the thing you really want people to know about you? In order for them to know you're a Christian? The default thing ends up being, I want them to know that I'm good. <laughs> I want them to know that I follow the rules. I want them to know that I live an upright life. And living an upright life, it can be a good thing. But if that's the way that we decide, 
we're good Christians or not, uh, that we've lost something, we're missing something. What Paul really wants to get at here is uh, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of the law? What's it supposed to do? Is it, is it really meant for us to lift ourselves up? To show how good we are? Or maybe it's meant to tell us something else. We're going to skip past a, a little section in the middle here. We're going to jump to uh, chapter 3, verse 9. I'll be honest, I wrote a sermon uh, based on those things, and the sermon would have been 40 minutes long. So I just cut out the middle part. Um, if you want to read it and ask me questions about it, or if you want to send me an email, I can send you that part of the sermon that I wrote. Uh, but uh, we're going to skip ahead to chapter 3, verse 9. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For you've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full, are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace, they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Again, pretty intense. Paul uses a collection of Old Testament uh, verses, Old Testament quotes, to make one point really clear. Based on your actions, you're not right with God. If I'm going to evaluate my life, like what I've done, the things I've said, the things I've thought, and say, am I right with God or not, based on that, I'm left with one conclusion. I'm not right with God. I can't be right with God based on, on the way I act, based on the things that I do. The law is not a way for, for me to, to show that I'm a good Christian. In fact, that he wants to tell us about a little different purpose of the law. Sometimes we see kind of these two things. You can put up the next slide there, Lydia. Um, as purposes of the law, sometimes we think of the law, well, it's kind of like this staircase, right, that if I can keep on advancing up and up, I'll get a little closer to God, I'll keep improving level, I'm going to level up, right, as a Christian, and keep on following his rules, and, and then I'll be a better Christian, right? And conveniently, if we're a little higher up on those stairs, we can look down at the people below that's not the purpose of God's law, nor, nor is it kind of just like a scale where it's like, well, I'll weigh the good against the bad, and if I've evened it out, then I'm, I'm right, I'm righteous, everything's good, me and God. No, what, what God's trying to communicate to us here is that uh, the law is, the law is more like a mirror. It just shows us what we really are. It shows us the reality, what's, what's really true. It's the reason why God here has to use the law um, to sweep out every remaining life that we think we have to stand on. If you think that you're righteous on your own, if you think you're living a good life, and because of that, God loves you, God needs to use the law to break you down. To sweep out every remaining life that you think you have to stand on. And to show you where you really are. If you're, if you're going to judge yourself based on your actions, based on your keeping the law, he needs to show you where you really stand. Which is to say that you don't stand. Let's read uh, the, the next two verses, and then we'll, we'll kind of work on concluding and applying some of these, uh, some of these things. And this is, uh, this is what was in the, the children's message as well, so you got a little primer from Dr. Lane here. Thank you for that. Uh, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law... We become conscious of our sin. That last verse, I think, kind of just puts this whole section in its clearest terms. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. That's what we've had a chance to kind of do, and it's been pretty heavy, hasn't it? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't feel good <laughs> right now. Um, I feel convicted. Because I realized not only, like, am I not as good as I thought I was? Not, not only have I failed to, to be right before God, 
I've also arrogantly supposed that I'm somehow better than the people around me. I've arrogantly thought that, that I know better or that I'm doing a little better than somebody else, but what God wants to tell me is that my works, my righteousness, my, my actions don't make me right before God, and it never will. In fact, that, that very law that I sometimes use to lift myself up, it's really the thing that should expose me for who I really am. It's been a lot of bad news today. But can bad news, can bad news ever also be good news? Can bad news ever be good news? Consider this. Um, I went for my annual checkup this past week. Everything was fine. But imagine, imagine that the doctor came out and with a somber look on his face, he said, Caleb, you have cancer. That'd be devastating. And maybe some of you have experienced that. That'd be bad news. But could those doctor's words, could they be good news? Not that cancer is a good thing or that that's good news, but wouldn't it be good news that he found it? Or would you rather have the doctor say nothing and let you go on your way. No, actually, that news is, is good news because now you can start to work to treat it, to fight it instead of just being, being killed by it. In the same way that this bad news from God, that we can't be right with Him, it's actually, in a way, you can say it's good news because God doesn't lie to us. He just tells us the truth. He lets, he lets us see ourselves as we truly are, he lets us see that the state that we'd be in if we rely on ourselves. See, the reason why God needs to, to break us down with the law, the reason why he needs to sweep out every remaining leg that we think we have to stand on, is because he wants us to stop relying on ourselves. We spend so much time trying to control our lives and be in control of every last little detail, and we think that we can do the same spiritually. That I can just rely on myself and my own goodness, and I'll get up tomorrow, and I'll do better, and then I'll be right with God. But God needs to use the law to break you down. Because he wants you to stop relying on yourself. And instead, he wants you to rely on him. He needs to break you down with the law because he doesn't want you to rely on yourself anymore. He needs to sweep out every light that you have to stand on because he needs you to fall right into his grace. And not into your own ability. So what's the cure to this cancer? What's the solution? What do we do to fix this problem? What's the beauty of it? It's, it's, not about, it's not about what you do. For once, it's not about what you do. It's about something God has done for you. Despite all of it, despite the unrighteousness and the sin, God still loves you. And because of that, he sent Jesus to die for you. And when Jesus died on the cross, he took all that sin, all that unrighteousness on himself, and he claimed it as his own. He said, that's mine. That's not yours anymore. That's mine. He took all of your sin and all of your unrighteousness on himself and died in your place. And all the wrath and all the anger of God that should have come barreling down right at me. God directed that at his son and said, He said that at Jesus. He said that at me. Not based on what I did, just based on what Jesus did for me. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 puts it really beautifully. God made him who had no sin uh, to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God sent you a rescuer. His name is Jesus. He didn't send Jesus down to condemn you. Uh, he didn't send Jesus down to, to say, uh, here's a second chance, and here's a few things that you can do to finally get it right. No, he, he sent someone down to do it for you. And not just for the people that grew up with the law, not just for the people, the good people, the people who suppose that they are good, but he sent Jesus down for everyone. No matter how broken, no matter how sinful they are, Jesus was sent for them, and that means he was sent for you. 
you see why Jesus has to break you down with his law? Why God has to break you down with his law? He wants to give you something so much better. Instead of a life relying on, on, on being good enough, he wants to give you something so much better. You see, living a life um, where your happiness, your satisfaction is found on, based on how good you've been and how good of a parent or how good of a student or good, how good of an employee you are, um, it doesn't satisfy, does it? It's like drinking salt water. You keep thinking that if you drink a little bit more, a little bit more, maybe, maybe they'll finally quench your thirst, but you're killing yourself. It doesn't work. So with the law, what God does is he slaps that little cup out of your hand, and he says, that doesn't satisfy. Let me give you something better. Let me give you the pure, undiluted water of the gospel. A gift. Something that God gives to you that says, it doesn't matter what you've done. This is yours. You're forgiven. That's what God gives us in the gospel. It's something totally different. In fact, like, which would you prefer? Would you prefer a life where you're always worried if you've done enough? If you've lived a good enough life, you're always uncertain, well, I don't really know, you know, where I stand with God. I'm not really certain. Would you rather live that life? Or would you rather live a life where God says he's done it all for you? Where at the end of the day, you can lay your head on your pillow with no fear. Your sin, placed on Jesus. Your unrighteousness, swapped with the righteousness of Jesus that's now given to you. Your relationship with God, totally at peace. No animosity, no uncertainty, but just peace. And so you can lay your head down at night. And instead of wondering if you've done enough, instead you can say, God, uh, I know I've failed you. Uh, forgive me. And you can know that he does. And you can rest easy. Because God loves you. And that's not going to change. What a beautiful way. So to go through life not filled with the pressure and the stress of trying to be better, but the freedom of being set free from it all. So there's a couple of ways that this impacts life for us, the way we see the world around us. One, it just changes uh, the way we see our relationship with God. Um, it's not a thing of questions. It's not of how am I doing today? How will it be tomorrow? When will God eventually bring the hammer down on me? No, God already brought the hammer down on his son. Because he wanted to show that he loves you. And so there's no uncertainty. You know that your relationship with God is at peace. Uh, it changes the way that we would show ourselves to the world. Right? If I want the world to see that I'm a Christian... Uh, I'm not concerned about them seeing if I'm good. What I want them to see is that I'm forgiven. I want them to know that actually I, I really needed forgiveness. I want them to know that I'm broken and I still mess up and I still make mistakes. I, in fact, I should probably want them to know that more than knowing that I'm good. Because if they know that, then they can know that I too need to rely on Jesus. That I too would receive that good news and not suppose that I'm good enough. Last thing it does God giving us something better, last thing it does is it, it changes how we see the law. Instead of the law being something that's like a, a have to, it's a want to. Understand that? Instead of being a have to, like you've got to do this, you've got to do that, and if you don't do that, then everything's going to be terrible, and God will hate you. And instead of that, you can take a look at God's law and you can say, you know what? If God's that loving to me, whatever he says, I think that's something I want to do. Even if it's hard for me, man, if God loves me that much and he would tell me to do that, I, I want to do that. I want to follow him, not because I have to, not because there's this pressure, not because it's about me showing how good I am, but because this must be good for me. Friends, don't find your confidence in the law. Find it in the gospel. Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray together as the worship team comes up to, to join us in our next song. Heavenly Father, um, too often we, when we've wondered if we're doing well enough, we've looked straight down and we've looked at ourselves. Forgive us for that. Um, help us 
Help break us of that mentality to always look to ourselves to find out if we're right with you. Direct our eyes heavenward. Direct our eyes to the cross instead to, to look at what your son did for us to know if we're right with you. Help us to realize that we don't bring anything to the table to save ourselves, but you brought it all. And you saved us. So help us to have the confidence in that, the peace, the freedom, and to know that we can live a life that is free from worry because you've taken away all of our sin. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, we're gonna